Um, so um, I am one of the fortunate few folks uh, around our state who, A, I'm not shy. So if I, if I have an opportunity to introduce myself to you, I'm gonna do that. And uh, when Dr. Woody Myers said he wanted to run uh, for governor, and I had a chance to sit down and talk to him, uh, I was blown away initially. Um, the level of intelligence, um, the fact that he's a scientist, and just has some common sense, uh, and, and you know, he left all the crazy, I don't know where he left it, I'm glad it's gone, if he ever had any, I'm sorry. Um, but, but the joy of being the deputy chair for engagement is that I get to reach out to amazing kids. So let me just, Aaron, this is much too much, so I'm not gonna read it all. <laughs> Uh, an Indianapolis native, uh, Dr. Woody Myers is a proud product of the Indianapolis Public Schools and is a graduate of Short Ridge High School. Uh, he completed his undergraduate studies at Stanford University and went on to earn his medical degree uh, from Harvard. Uh, and at 23, by the way. So what were y'all doing at 23, you slackers? <laughs> Uh, at the age of 30, uh, Dr. Myers was the youngest to serve as Indiana State Health Commissioner and held his appointment under both Democrat and Republican administrations. Uh, as Health Commissioner, Woody effectively led over 28,000 employees, oversaw five state institutions, and worked every day to improve maternal and child health, chronic disease control, childhood immunizations, and preventative health and care services. During his tenure, Woody he helped make Indiana a leader in the AIDS education and gain national recognition when he fought to keep Ryan White, a teenager with AIDS, in school when he was uh, when the school uh, district banned him. Y'all, welcome to the stage. Um, uh, someone that I, I greatly admire and um, I actually get a little nervous sometimes. Y'all give it up for Dr. Woody Myers. Thank you. Thank you I don't have questions, and, and, and we only get a half an hour, but just kind of introduce yourself uh, to the folks real quick uh, about why you decided that you wanted to run uh, for the governor, the highest seat in our state. Well, first of all, thank you for that very kind of introduction, and I appreciate being here uh, with you tonight. I understand there might be a sporting event uh, <laughs> that's competing uh, with the, the uh, audience, uh, but nonetheless, I'm glad that you all are here. Uh, and I relish the opportunity to communicate with audience such as yours. Uh, uh, I am uh, very happy to tell you that uh, I have been involved in public uh, sector, private sector service now for uh, 25 or 30 years, and I have a choice. Uh, as I was thinking through, what do I want to do now that I'm in the fourth quarter uh, of my uh, career? Uh, and uh, in the game of life, I believe that, that uh, I've got, got a couple touchdown lead. I mean, I've been very That's fortunate. And, I've been uh, very uh, uh, happy to participate in all forms of uh, healthcare and management leadership in so many different ways. And, and uh, I, I know that uh, I've got a wonderful family, wonderful friends, uh, but I just could not coast uh, out with that, that lead at all and felt that I still got a few more touchdowns in me. That's uh, what's up. And, uh, Come on, Tom Brady. <laughs> well, no, not, not, not Tom Brady. <laughs> but, uh, unless he comes to Indianapolis, and then I'm all for Tom Brady. Uh, but uh, I guess my mic is. Uh, my mic went out uh, a little bit. Testing. Did you? Here you go. Here you go. Take mine. There you go. That's how we do that. But I am. Uh, I, I am. I'm very happy to tell you that. Uh, that instead, what I decided to, to do was to offer my talents, my services, my my health to the state that I love, my, my uh, state of Indiana. Uh, I am uh, a, a very uh, pleased to, to, to let you know that uh, I am not gonna become uh, that angry old man throwing things at the television, uh, wondering why these young whippersnappers can't get it done. And I'm, I'm, I'm not gonna become that, that guy who sits around all day and writing uh, op-eds, although I do think op-eds are important. Uh, I need to, needed to roll up my sleeves and, and get back into the game, literally and figuratively and to coach the, the upcoming team that's coming uh, along, the, the incredibly smart, the talented, and dedicated young people that I'm running into across the state of Indiana, who with uh, some coaching leadership and a little bit more education are gonna be able to, to rock the problem, solve the problem that uh, my generation either created or should have solved. Uh, so uh, I am uh, here to, to, uh, to see if I can get uh, about 1.25 million 
Hoosiers to, to, to vote uh, for the, uh, the ticket uh, that we will create uh, after the, uh, the, uh, the primary uh, in the state of Indiana in May. Uh, we've got about 244 days uh, to get that job done, and I'm ready to work every single day to make it happen. That's what's up. Okay, so let's get down to the nitty gritty. Uh, first question is from uh, Stonewall Democrat, South Central Indiana. The number one cause of death among LGBTQ plus uh, people under 25 is suicide. As bad as this statistic is, it's even worse for trans kids and the LGBTQ plus kids of color. The two main causes of this unnecessary deaths are bullying and family rejection, ignorance and archaic rules, like rules concerning bathroom accessibility for trans kids create the fear of animosity which leads to bullying. In a proposal before the legislature right now, trans kids would be forced to compete in sports as the gender they are signed on, on their original birth certificate. The governor has a lot of power over the education system in Indiana. What could and would you do to make our schools more inclusive and, and to safeguard our LGBTQ plus kids and young adults? Well, first of all, the, uh, the issue of suicide uh, in the LGBTQ plus community is significant uh, nationwide and here in the state of Indiana. Uh, and the issue of suicide for, for young people has been increasing, unfortunately, in recent decades. And, uh, in, in, in Indiana, suicide is uh, higher than it is in the, nation, in the national average, but in the, uh, the uh, category of kids 15 to 24, it's uh, disproportionately high, and so uh, it's an issue. Uh, we know uh, that uh, there are a variety of reasons why when people feel rejected, isolated, uh, unappreciated, and unloved, uh, depression can set in. And we also know that with the, the right kind of behavioral health services, the right kind of support, the right kind of love, uh, that does not need to result in the uh, tragic decision uh, to take one's own life. And I know that uh, so many of these issues do originate uh, when if young people especially are interacting with each other in schools, and so therefore I believe that the schools have a special role to play in the solution set. Uh, one of the uh, most important responsibilities of the governor, especially in the, the, for the next governor, uh, is to appoint people who have the right sensibilities towards th these issues. And uh, I will be the first governor uh, to make the appointment of the state superintendent of education because the law has been changed such that that position is no longer an elected position. So I will guarantee this audience and any audience that I talk to that uh, the person that uh, will get that responsibility will have the right sensibilities and the right experiences uh, to lead the state into a new era of inclusiveness, uh, an era that unfortunately for all kids does not exist today. In addition, the governor has appointments to make uh, with respect to the State Board of Education. The State Board of Education is a major budget oversight policy uh, agency, which unfortunately hasn't done the job that it needed to do in a variety of ways, in my opinion, over the last uh, several years. But the appointments that I make will have the, the same uh, characteristics as the superintendent, because that board uh, will have serious and important responsibilities uh, to execute the plans for education in Indiana and to put in the programs that will have the, the most impact. I don't believe that there's a one-size-fits-all approach. I believe that there are differences in how you might approach this in larger schools versus smaller schools or urban areas versus rural areas. So we will call upon the appropriate group of experts uh, to help us uh, to make the, the best decisions possible. But in terms of attitude, uh, in terms of uh, the priorities, I, I, I absolutely uh, can uh, guarantee you that it will be uh, on, on the, uh, the A-list of what uh, the next governor will be doing. Excellent. Excellent. This is also from Stonewall Democrats. Even though we know that the majority of Hoosiers don't agree with them, Indiana's Republican-led legislatures seem to be bent on it. Uh, they left out a word there. I'm not going to say it. Then on introducing anti-LGBTQ plus legislation as well as legislation to limit women's self-determination and reproductive rights. This happens every session. It seems the only thing that has really protected the community to this point has been private business stepping private businesses stepping in and refusing to do business with states that support such bigoted laws as Mike Pence's RIFRA. What can you what can and will you do as governor to support the LGBTQI community and turn Indiana into a state of inclusion 
as opposed to exclusion? Again, uh, for me, uh, that absolutely will be the priority because uh, inclusion is the, is the answer to so many uh, different uh, problems within society today. So the appointments that one makes uh, along these lines are going to be uh, absolutely key. I, I, I know that uh, RIFRA uh, bound together the disparate sections of our state, uh, different uh, interests in our state that probably didn't have a natural reason to come together in many respects uh, uh, before. RIFRA uh, got the business community, uh, the, uh, the LBGTQ community, uh, all together uh, to, uh, to, to work for the defeat of, of that legislation. And although it did not go far enough, the, the, the fix, uh, and needs to go further uh, in future legislative sessions. Uh, I believe that uh, that uh, coalition can and should be put together, kept together, uh, for uh, future efforts. Uh, I know that uh, the, the, the threat and loss of many millions of dollars of convention business uh, and the threat and loss of, of new factories, new businesses coming to Indiana was the motivation behind uh, many uh, as a part of that coalition, but it wasn't the only motivation. And I think that by people coming together, listening to each other, understanding each other's positions, uh, that uh, there was a collaborative spirit that was generated that as governor, I would certainly uh, want to engender, continue, et cetera. So I know that, uh, that uh, we've got a group of folk uh, in, in our state that do care about each other. Uh, they need to rise to the top. They need to do what they do best, and that's to, uh, to lead by example. Uh, I know that uh, uh, the issue of, uh, of restrooms has been one of the more divisive issues that uh, we are, uh, have as, as a society a struggle with. And although uh, I don't, again, believe that there is one solution that fits every circumstance, we can come together and, and make good decisions that uh, don't leave anybody out, that, that, that solve the problem in a sensible uh, way. And I just know that with that kind of collaboration uh, at the top, uh, with that bully pulpit that was mentioned uh, uh, that I will use, uh, we can do the right thing for the right reason at the right time throughout our state. Excellent, excellent. And so this, was, this next question is actually from our Monroe County Black Democrat Caucus. But what it actually speaks to is the intersectionality of, of, of our party. Um, would you use your position as governor to advance stronger hate crimes legislation? And how would you do so? Uh, I, as I referenced a little a minute ago, uh, the, the hate crime legislation uh, does need to, to, to be fixed. Uh, they come forward uh, in, a, in a way that is collaborative and positive. Uh, we didn't include all the, the folks that we needed to include uh, with the fix uh, to refer, and I would certainly want that to happen. But in order for that to happen, we need some changes in our legislature. Come on. Uh, as much as the, the governor wants to do things uh, in Indiana, if you don't bring along a a sufficient number of our legislative uh, leaders as well, you're not going to get the things that you want done done. Uh, so I, I want uh, the state to, to also, in addition to electing a new governor uh, to the, the state of Indiana, to uh, elect some uh, di additional legislators who feel the, the same way so that we can create the, the legislative and executive branch of coalition that would be required in order to make the, the legal changes that need to be made. Now this one's a little touchy. What are your views on charter schools and publicly funded vouchers, especially as they pertain to black students and families? How would you advance your agenda on these subjects? And, and it is tricky, yeah. and uh, this is not one that I would, uh, will dance around. I will try to address it directly. There are some outstanding public schools, and there are some public schools that are clearly problematic. There are some outstanding charter schools, and there are some charter schools that are clearly problematic. Uh, we know that over the last uh, decade or more, uh, we, we've heard parents around the country and here in the state of Indiana asking for choices uh, to be made, and, and that movement led to the creation of a charter school movement that has proliferated in the minds of some far faster and, and, and far more in a negative direction than a positive direction that those of the, that originally uh, originated the movement wanted it to, to, to go. Uh, I know that uh, we've got real problems with uh, some, but not all, of the charters that are out there today. Uh, and uh, I've stated uh, in uh, past communication that uh, if I elected, then the first thing I'd want to do is to put a moratorium on new charters until we fix the formula, fix the oversight, 
uh, fix the funding in a way that made more sense than it does today. Uh, we, we, that, that, that doesn't mean you stop the charters that are there now, but what you do is you, you create a, a, an approach that will a allow us to make sure that the dollars, the tax dollars are being used, they're being used well. And we've got many examples today, far too many, uh, that tell us that those dollars are not being used well. Uh, and the, the complicating factor, one of the complicating factors, is that, that in, in, in many circumstances, the, the charter schools are within the public school, under the public school umbrella. Uh, and there are lots of hybrids today. In Indianapolis, for instance, there are the innovation schools, and then you've got the private schools, and then you've got the, the voucher programs, and many folks, and most users, uh, don't understand the nuances of and the, the differences between those various categories. So having a simpler way to explain the differences and having a simpler way for parents to understand what their choices would be is something that I would want our new superintendent of education and our state board of education to, to, to work towards. Uh, but most importantly, I think it's that it, it, we've got to figure out a fair funding formula. 93% uh, of the students today in Indiana are in the, under the public education umbrella. Uh, but they're not getting 93% of the, the funds, 93% of the love, 93% of the attention. Uh, we've got to make sure that, that they are getting what they need in order to be successful as we work our way through. Uh, the problems that, that, that I just outlined. And the way to do that is in collaboration with the organizations that represent our teachers, in collaboration with the state's uh, outstanding school superintendents. I had an opportunity to meet with uh, a number of superintendents in uh, Southern Indiana recently, an exceptionally talented group of, of, of individuals uh, who understand the nuances and the differences of where we need to go. And I would depend heavily on their recommendations as, as well. But most importantly, we, we need to support and understand the teachers that are out there doing the job every single day. Uh, we have got far too many teachers that feel as if their profession is no longer as respected as it, as it should be, and they've got good evidence to support that, because if you look at the increases in funding for teacher salaries over the last uh, 15 years, from about 2002 to 2017, in the study that, that I'm aware of, uh, Indiana is dead last, 51 out of 50 states, and because the District of Columbia is included as well, we are at the very bottom of, of that list. Mm. Uh, and, and that means to me that we clearly, clearly haven't paid attention uh, to this issue. And in spite of the fact that we hear from our governor that, that there, if there's been over a $700 million increase in the budget, you know, if, if you give a, a starving patient a loaf of bread, uh, that doesn't make up for the, 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 the decades or more of starvation that, that has occurred. And, and I just know that we can do a better job in getting the money to the superintendents to get to the teachers through adjustments to the formula. I know that, that we can give a, uh, we can create a better formula to get the money that's available through your and my tax dollars to the school districts for improvements in technology. Uh, for making sure that we're using technology appropriately. That was one of the problems, Dana, with the, uh, with the I step, then I learn, and then uh, let's reject both of them approach that we've used uh, uh, thus far with many millions of dollars again going uh, in, into the, the, the sewer, essentially, because uh, those uh, results are going to be used. But the problem, one of the problems there was that, that some schools are, are very adept and have the money to, to use technology appropriately, and yay for them, I'm happy for them, I don't want that to go away, but there are other school districts who've been starved so much that they don't have that, and that's hurt big school districts, for instance, like Indianapolis, uh, disproportionately. So we need to think through what's the best way to make those adjustments going forward such that the, the, the teachers get what they need, the superintendents have the flexibility that they need, we have an efficient, effective way to measure our success and therefore make improvements as they need to be made. And that's just a common sense approach that I would, would use uh, with a new superintendent of education that understands where we need to go, a new state board of education, a set of appointments that, that want us to get there, uh, and, and a group of, uh, of, of uh, representatives of those teachers of, uh, and others who want to help. And, and that includes the, the general public and parents because they have a, a, a right to participate in those decisions and I would want them included as well. Well, doctor, you know, as my mama used to say, common sense ain't so common. You already know. All right. Uh, 
This is from the College Democrats of Indiana University. Um, for students, one of the top issues is climate change. Now, it's nice to actually have a conversation with a scientist. As a governor, what will you do to bring sus uh, sustainable industries such as solar and wind to Indiana? Well, when, when I was a young whippersnapper, which was many, many years ago, uh, they said, and you know who they are, uh -huh, uh -huh. they said that you couldn't do wind in Indiana because we weren't at the right uh, latitude. They said that you couldn't do solar in Indiana because there wasn't enough That's sun. Right. Uh, has anybody been up I-65 to uh, Chicago? Uh, uh, I, I guarantee you that, uh, that there's plenty of evidence uh, that you can use wind successfully. And it, has anybody been to the Indianapolis airport yes. uh, recently? Yes. Not only are the old solar panels working, I, I look, it looks like they're putting in a lot of new ones. And so I, I know that we can use wind and we can use solar and we can use renewable energy in a much better way in Indiana than ever before. And you know what? That technology is getting even better. The folks, and I, I, I would bet you that some of them are at IU, uh, maybe Purdue and Notre Dame hey, 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 as well. Hey, go, go get us put out now. <laughs> I know, I got to look careful. But I, I would suspect that there are people working every day to even make, it, make that technology even better. So I would want us to take full advantage of the advances that have been made. And, and you know, the state of Indiana, Dana, as I know, uh, we have a lot of property that's under the jurisdiction mm -hmm. of the state. And it yes. would seem to me that it would be wise to take advantage of this technology in those properties for state uh, uh, energy use. And so uh, I, last time I looked over at the state house, and maybe there wasn't anything there that, 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 that I could see, and I didn't go all the way around. I didn't see any solar panels. No. Uh, I didn't see any on the state office building. Uh, I, I would want to put some there, and I would want to also put some in Indiana prisons. I would want to put wind where it's appropriate. Now, that does not mean in the middle of the state park. So that anybody that's worried about that, that's not where you put it. But nonetheless, there are sites that we could clearly generate uh, our own renewable and then lead by example in the state of Indiana to, to, to make uh, that technology far more useful for state purposes and then find ways to encourage the private sector. And, 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 and by protecting coal jobs, that's not the way I would do it. Coal jobs are important jobs for the coal miners that are doing them today, but let's help them to evolve into renewable energy. What would be wrong with creating more efforts to help them to become part of the renewable effort? And coal is, is, is moving, we, we are moving away from coal because natural gas is now far more available and less expensive and less polluting, but it's still a fossil fuel, it still generates uh, a, a necessary car. But let's move to renewables, but let's do so in, in, a, in a fashion uh, that some of our utilities are trying to move in, uh, that others are trying to block. And so I guarantee you that a Myers administration, Department of Environmental Management, Department of Health, and Department of Natural Resources will work together to make certain that we take climate change into consideration in all of our decision making and that we're using the laws that are on the books today to move us forward faster than this administration has moved us forward. Did, did you see how the, the scientists got all sciencey? He was excited when he got to talk about science. When, when you don't have people that understand the technology and the science, and they just making up laws as they go because their pockets are getting full. That's why we're, we have bills in the House and the Senate right now that say you can't shut down coal plants, even though the economy is actually already dictating that coal is uh, a, a, an industry that is fading and and and. Commerce and capitalism is saying we need to close it down, but we have people who are still trying to hold on uh, with white knuckles. Okay, uh, last question, sir. I, I, I love watching them get excited. Cause see, y'all, we need people who are excited about moving Indiana forward, and, and as you can see, Dr. Myers is. Many IU college students are products of uh, the public school system. Those students are now attending a public university. They know how important our public schools are in shaping children's lives. In November of last year, over 20,000 teachers from across Indiana descended on the State House to say the same thing. Public schools are integral to our society and irreplaceable. As governor, how will you ensure that public schools are properly funded and prioritized? So we're going to kind of go back to that. Well, I was, uh, I was there uh, on the uh, State House grounds uh, when those teachers and their supporters and others of us 
who uh, care about education uh, were, were there. I, I don't believe our governor was there that day. No, I he was out fundraising. Check his schedule again but to make sure, but I don't believe he was there to listen uh, that day. Uh, I, I did have my, my red sweater on, and I hope that we don't have to do that again. I, not, not that, that there is not enough energy to bring even more teachers back if required, but uh, under uh, an administration that I would lead, uh, we would absolutely need to prioritize uh, what, what happens uh, uh, in public education, as I referred to uh, earlier. Uh, I'm a graduate of, uh, of public schools. I went to, as you said earlier, Shortridge High School. I understand the, the importance of making sure that quality public education is available to all. And, and I, in my lifetime, in the lifetime of, of, of virtually everyone, if not everyone in this room, that's going to continue. We are not going to move away from it. We're certainly not going to move away from it as, as a state if I'm, if, if I'm the, uh, the governor. Uh, and, and education is, and health care, and, and those, are the, those are the two of the issues that apply to everyone, uh, irrespective of, of race, irrespective of, of, of geography. Uh, and that they are both in, they are both areas where we need to make so much more progress, so much faster than we've made uh, in the past. And I just want to say that uh, that uh, there are a number of very smart people in this room and around our state who are not being given the opportunity to, to contribute what they know to the solution set that we need to evaluate. So as governor, my job would be to bring together the best people that we can find uh, to. Uh, I won't say lock the door, but give them enough food and water to get the, the collaboration done, done and then use what they tell us in order to generate new policy in order, order to uh, enforce the laws that are on the books and if we need new laws to create those so that we can move Indiana to, to further faster. You know, for so many uh, generations, it seems like we've had an attitude that uh, it, 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 if it's good enough, that's good enough for Indiana. Well, good enough is no longer good enough uh, for our state. We, we have got to push the, unpush the pause button, push the fast forward button uh, on so many uh, issues, uh, including the ones that we, we've talked about uh, this evening. The, 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 the theory of the case is simple. Uh, learn from what the mistakes that others have made, read the science, bring together the people that know, uh, use your dollars effectively, don't waste tax dollars. Come on, come on. Uh, you know, the first thing that some folks like to say that the, if a Democrat gets elected, the next thing Taxes you're gonna do is you're, you know, the buying your budget is what, $40 billion? Uh, I guarantee you, with the experiences that, that I've had dealing with budgets now for many decades, we're gonna find some savings. Uh, we're gonna find some opportunities there to be more efficient. We're going to find uh, some room in order to do some of the things that it seems like haven't been prioritized today, like increasing uh, uh, teacher salaries, like uh, bringing together, uh, bringing people together to, to make uh, policy change. Uh, and the, with respect to institutions like uh, Indiana University and other public universities, to support uh, what, what's going on here and to do all we can to make sure that the graduates uh, from this university want to stay here. Yeah, yeah. Indiana, I would, I would love it if we could increase the percentage of Hoosier graduates and maybe Boilermaker graduates and Irish graduates. We want them all. all. We want all, them all. All of them, we stay, want them all stay right here in the state of Indiana. Uh, to Indiana serve, Wesleyan uh, graduates. Oh, okay. Well, Butler graduates and all of them. I, we, can't, I, we, we can't name them all. See, that's the problem. You start with one set and then you leave somebody out and then they're going to be. So, uh, what I would like for us to do is to, to make sure that we have a state that that is so attractive that we, we've got to, we got to, we got to say, you know, we, we maybe we need to put a line at the That's state right. border because we got so many people That's that right. want to come in. That would be a problem that, that, that I'd like uh, us to have because I love this state. I, I was born and raised here. I'm a third generation Hoosier. Uh, I, I know that we can do a, a, a better job. And if uh, 1.25 plus or minus million Hoosiers, uh, 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 give me that opportunity. I will devote every single day uh, to to making sure that uh, that we make that that happen. So thank you again for this uh, wonderful well, opportunity. Well, I ain't done with you yet. I ain't done with you just yet. I ain't done with you just yet. Hold on, hold on, hold on. I know we need to wrap this up, but I want to send you out um, on that crazy high note. Like you've already been on a high note. I want to send you over the moon. We are in the midst of a pandemic, Doctor. Uh, you were the health commissioner. 
for the state of Indiana. And, and he doesn't know that I'm asking this, so I apologize in advance, but I think it's, I think it would be remiss of us to, when you have the knowledge and the expertise sitting right next to you that you not, you know, you go ahead and address that, that big elephant in the room. Talk about, uh, and, and this could be your closing statement, talk about how you would be handling uh, this situation versus what that other dude is doing. Well, it's, it's uh, thank you for that. It's, it's not the, uh, the elephant in the room that I worry about. It's the party of elephants in Washington that, mm. I, that, I, that I worry about. And it's, uh, it, it, it's the little tiny virus. Uh, the first thing you've got to think about when, you, when you're dealing with a pandemic like this that's caused by a virus is the, the people with the virus are not the enemy. Come on. The virus is the enemy. When I was health commissioner back in the 80s, uh, too many Hoosiers got that confused. Uh, and uh, the, they targeted the individuals who had been identified as having HIV AIDS as, as the problem, when in fact uh, they, they too were, were suffering, as so many patients today are being identified for suffering with a viral disease uh, for which today we do not have a cure. Come on. Uh, we, we do have a lot of very talented people in, uh, in Washington and other places in the National Institutes of Health and Atlanta, the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, the Food and Drug Administration, who are working day and night now to speed our, our, our discovery process with respect to a vaccine. Now, you don't want them to work too fast. Right, because that's you what want them Because you want them to make right. sure that it works and has to be efficacious. But then we have to ramp up production uh, quickly so that we make it available globally. Uh, not just to those who can pay with their American Express cards. Come on. Uh, but we got to make it available to everybody because it's going, it's being generated, that research, with tax dollars. Uh, and, and that's why we have to be uh, absolutely fair and think about that process now. Uh, I uh, uh, wrote a, 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 uh, an editorial recently uh, about what I think we should do in Indiana. Well, number one, we listen to the experts who actually know what they are talking about. Uh, number two, I, I think it's past time now for us to create something I call the Indiana Coronavirus, Coronavirus, Coronavirus Leadership Group. Well, why would you do that? Well, it goes, coronavirus and all the issues go well beyond public health, although public health is at the core. Just think about it for a second. The, the, the patients who succumbed to the illness in the state of Washington were where? They were in a nursing home. Why did that happen? Well, because when you're in close proximity to infected individuals, the virus has a chance through the kinds of transmission routes that we know about today to move from one individual to another. So what happens when you have a, 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 a virus present in a confined setting where people don't have a lot of options mm -hmm. in terms of where they move? It's, it's not as if uh, you get uh, the virus into a nursing home, there are immediately lots of places for those patients to go. Think about what happens if the, heaven forbid, the, the virus is in a prison or a jail. Hmm. Uh, what do we do in, the, in those circumstances? That's why we need a leadership group thinking about these issues, putting together contingency plans, working on the solutions today, so that when tomorrow something happens, we're ready to go. Uh, and we're not getting that leadership uh, that we need in order to make that decision, those decisions, and to be ready for those. And it's going to require public health, it's going to require the hospitals, it's going to require the, the judiciary, law enforcement, business, labor, it's going to require the public, because they are the public is going to be hungry for a, 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 the accurate information, the accurate processes that we should put it up into place that we're going to get us to the right uh, decision uh, and, and so that they can trust them. That was the problem with HIV AIDS, uh, that, that we didn't have those mechanisms in place early on. Now, ultimately, we got there. Right. Uh, but let's jump ahead now to the, to the, the right solution by putting that, uh, the group of people together today to begin thinking that through. It, it has to be bipartisan. It, it has to be urban and rural. It should be throughout the state of Indiana, not just in Indianapolis. Uh, the, to the best extent possible, the meeting should be public. I think it should be funded by a coalition of charitable organizations that we have, fortunately, throughout foundations that we have throughout the state. I think right now is the time to put something like that together in order to get ready 
for what clearly is going to cause a, a, a lot of angst uh, if we don't get our arms around it sooner rather than later. Right. Uh, the virus is here. Uh, we just haven't identified it yet. Uh, it's every day we learn about new cases, and when we get testing in all of the 50 states, we're going to learn that it's been here longer than anyone thought it was here. You can't contain it through a mask. Uh, you can't contain it by outdated thinking and outdated policies and selective uh, bans on travel of one country but not another. That's not the way to go about it. Right. There are elements of travel restriction. There are elements of isolation of patients that need to be thought through. Uh, and that's why a leadership group is so important, to make those decisions thoughtfully, carefully, and fairly so that the public has trust in them when they are made. Excellent, excellent. Y'all give it up for Dr. Goodman. Indiana's next governor. Wouldn't you guys have loved to have that kind of person on the table with the coronavirus? Somebody that understands what's going on. Y'all give it up. Dr. Goodman.